So now we turn to a whole class of structures which are constrained in just one dimension, i.e. they are two-dimensional planar layered structures where the direction of restricted motion is uh, just along this axis here. So the semiconductor superlattice which is a structure already in use in devices, is made using the molecular beam epitaxy methods described in Chapter 5 to put down, for example, a layer of gallium arsenide, a semiconductor, interspersed with a layer of gallium aluminum arsenide and then another layer of gallium arsenide and so on to form a very large periodic structure. If this period here is D, then recalling our discussion of the piles distortion in Chapter 7, you know that the Bruin zone for the semiconductor, so then now this is E versus K, will be split into subbands at intervals pi over D. So where before one might have had a dispersion relation like this, one now splits this dispersion into discrete sets of bands, as shown in the slide here. One of the advantages of doing this is that in constraining the motion of electrons now to orbits that lie perpendicular to Z, because their wave vector is quantized in the z direction, so those states have high energy, one minimizes scattering events, and in this way can build up semiconductor devices with very high mobility. So gallium arsenide, gallium aluminum arsenide uh, heterostructures are used, for example, in high-speed transistors and microwave devices. We now consider a very interesting application of a, a heterostructure uh, which is a very thin device in which very high electric fields can be generated. If we consider the gallium aluminum arsenide regions as regions of particularly high energy, so they are in effect insulators, the transmission through the device arises from delocalization of electrons over the subbands that exist in the gallium arsenide regions. If, however, one puts a high electric field across such a device, one then tilts the potential, trying to draw here, and so now subbands that were previously aligned are no longer aligned. So what you see in this diagram here is an initial rapid rise in current as voltage is applied across the device, but as the bias moves the subbands out of alignment, the current actually starts to fall as the bias is increased until eventually you reach a situation where subband N aligns with subband N plus 1 and the current rises again. Devices like this are said to have a negative differential resistance, NDR, and this results in a host of very interesting device applications. There's a question at the back of this uh, chapter that illustrates one of these. Let me draw out this IV characteristic somewhat expanded now. So current versus voltage. The current increases initially and then falls and then rises again. One can draw on this diagram a load line which represents the nonlinear device now in series with a resistor connected to some fixed voltage V. And what you will discover, and I urge you to do the problem in the back of the book, 
is that for resistors of a particular carefully chosen values, the device is found to have multiple operating points, of which only these two are stable, and therefore a device biased in just the right way will flip between these two operating points, operating either as a switch or an oscillator. Here's another very interesting application of a two-dimensional uh, confined structure, once again gallium arsenide, gallium aluminum arsenide, which is the quantum Hall effect. So given in these layered structures that the motion of electrons is confined to the conducting layers, if a magnetic field is placed perpendicular to the layers, the motion of the electrons is an orbit around this, this magnetic field with a frequency, the cyclotron resonance frequency, given by the charge on the electron times the magnetic field divided by the mass of the electron. Now the energies associated with these cyclotron orbits are quantized in the following way. So that what was previously a continuous density of states in the semiconductor, so we'll now plot energy on this axis and density of states here, collapses into a series of spikes in the density of states at each of these successive cyclotron resonance frequencies, n equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now, as bias is applied across this device, if we say the Fermi energy is here, these cyclotron orbitals can sweep past the Fermi energy, leading to a transient increase in conductance as the density of states associated with these cyclotron orbitals becomes equal to the Fermi energy. This phenomenon is a little hard to measure directly, but it can be measured indirectly by measuring the Hall resistance of a device. In measuring the Hall resistance, one applies a voltage V across a device like this, places it in a magnetic field so that a current is driven this way. The effect of the cyclotron orbital is to deflect carriers perpendicular to the magnetic field, with the result that a Hall voltage can be picked up perpendicular to the direction of the main current. And from this a Hall resistance can be deduced. This Hall resistance was found by von Klitzing to be precisely quantized in multiples of Planck's constant divided by the electronic charge squared. You'll recognize that this is just twice the Landauer resistance. For the discovery of this fundamental quantum of resistance, Von Klitzing was awarded the Nobel Prize.